Um, I feel that we have a strong lack of um, world history, black history, black studies, uh, and, and, and the light. And so with this being about anti-race strategy um, that City of Liverpool College is looking to create and looking to talk about, that's why uh, I'm going to cover a series of topics today. So with that in mind, you know, um, I look, I, main thing is Elaine said to be real. So I was looking at, well, in what direction are we to be looking at race as a part of like the agenda? And like what we have to look at is, and we have to be honest. In the past, you know, um, I'm just going to have to be blatant about it. White people and black people in that aspect. In the past, it's been kind of like looked at from on high, you know, like as if we were still within a Ptolemaic universe, you know, where it's kind of like, oh, that's a sad thing that's happening over there. Oh, another um, black person has been killed. That's sad. Oh, um, this event is over here. Like these people are being um, marginalized or affected. That's sad. And the problem is, is that, it's always been looked at, it's not my problem, it's that's their problem. And what we have seen this year is that people have started to change their thinking. You know, um, if you look at Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. In the, in the springtime, when they started to march peacefully, um, it wasn't just Black people anymore. It was Black people, white people, people of all races and colors were marching together. And a big example of that was 50 states at one point, 50 states of the United States actually were united for the first time since its development to march along to one singular topic of Black Lives Do Matter. And what that means is, is that they have now actually opened themselves up to listening. And this is what is indeed important. And this is why this has to be continued. It has to be continued through education. Because if you actually think about it, who's talking about that anymore? You know, this was in the spring. Now we're in our dark winter. You know, our dark winter is, uh, uh, what is it, night of discontent, you know? Um, so people have stopped having those conversations. So I, I feel that those conversations need to be continued. And in that fashion is, is that what the uh, COLC looking to make this a part of the agenda. I'm thinking you're saying to yourself as teachers, how can we be involved? How can we continue these conversations? Well, the first thing we have to do is peel back the curtain, right? Um, we have to peel back the curtain to that is, that's not as important as we once thought it was. You know, our history, our history has been what is considered like whitewashed. What that means is, is that it's been wiped away and it's not been in the class. It's not been in the history books. Students aren't taught to learn about this, that, or the other thing. And then when it comes to moments like these, Black History Month, what they have been doing is, is that they go to the classics. You got to know about Martin Luther King. You got to know about Rosa Parks. You know, some even go deep and say, well, do you remember what happened with Emmett Till? Without going, Who? <laughs> the whole point about it is, is that these are these heroes, but you're looking at the 1950s. You're not looking further back, right? So then they say, what are you talking about? Here in Liverpool, we respect uh, um, uh, that slavery was wrong. So we have created Slavery Remembrance Day. I've been here for 20 years, so that means I've been here from the beginning of Slavery Remembrance Day. I was hired as a documentarian to film different events of Slavery Remembrance Day. And so Liverpool made a formal apology uh, for slavery because the ships were built here, left from here. And then that aspect is, is that, okay, why do we keep retreading the same wheel like hamsters, right? That's not our history. That's not your history. There's so much more. And because we have ignored it, especially in schools, this is where the problem is. Because our young people grow up with a distorted view of the skin color of my skin is less than. Yeah? And that's the problem. You know, there's always been this factor of I have to keep someone else down. So 
you're noticeably a different color than me, so I'll keep you down. Whereas if we are white people, what we have stopped looking at was we're not you're you're not white people. You are Irish people. You're Italians. You're uh, um, English. You're you know French. You're Spanish. I mean, what I'm trying to say is we need to go back to defining the difference as we did in the olden days. And then what I mean by the olden days is I'm talking again about in the way of when England left. Um, King George came over on a Mayflower, all that other kind of stuff. When they actually went to New York and they um, formed the Five Points, you know, where they were separated cultures, you know, the Irish, the Italians, the Dutch, the Norwegians, all of that. And they had to learn how to mesh, and they meshed under their one skin tone, right? And then so we're white and you're black. And in that fashion is, is that, well, because from my perspective, you used to be slaves, so you used, we already looked at you as labor. And this is what the problem is. Because when Lincoln freed the slaves, if you want to talk about slavery in that aspect, what happened was there were reparations at that point in time. And those reparations involved like 40 acres and a mule, which people have heard of, like, say, if you looked at a Spike Lee movie. But... What happened was blacks, when they actually got their freedom, they got some form of money. What they did was they didn't drink it away, right? They thrived. They shared. They formed communities. Now, one such tragic formation of a community of success was the huge events of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which people also have heard rumored of Black Wall Street. Now, I could say, well, right now, uh, there's a thing on your machine that you could put your hand up, right? Like, so you could just press the button on your thing. How many of you heard of Black Wall Street or Tulsa, Oklahoma? Thank you, Kersey. <laughs> no one? No one? I have. Come find the chats. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michaela, <laughs> and everything. But I mean, like, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at like the lack of uh, hand signals on the people that are on the screen. So, sorry, we have as well. On okay, yeah, thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you. Remember, remember, Kirsty said it was interactive, right? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I was I about was well. to walk out. <laughs> 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 you can't be having an anti-race strategy uh, and not even know what I'm talking about here. So. That's true. That's the whole point. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, Tulsa was a tragedy, right? Um, now, would you believe, as an American and as a black American, I've never heard of Tulsa? I've never heard of that event? Why? I'm 54 years old. 55, maybe. <laughs> I've never heard of it. Until I watched the TV show that came out last year, HBO's Watchmen. Now, please don't, don't, don't hate me for watching television. I'm watching good television. And then that aspect is, is that the people who watched that show, well, their minds were open. It's like all of a sudden we're asleep and we've been awakened. This is a massacre. This is a massacre of jealous white people who systematically destroyed a neighborhood of black people who were living their lives successfully, felt they deserved it. The what little money they got after the, the crime and tragedy that was committed upon their parents and themselves, that they succeeded, right? And out of that jealousy, they were attacked, wiped away, and it was whitewashed. Now, there will, of course, be educated bad people who probably say, hey, I've heard of what Black Wall Street and all that kind of stuff. And even white people say, hey, I heard of it. But it's not, it wasn't in our consciousness as a people, right, to know that there was this form of what I looked upon as Black excellence, and it was wiped away. Yeah? Tragically. Now, the other thing about that period of time is, is that a lot of you may have heard of the film Birth of a Nation. Yeah? Right? So I'll just I'll just take it that you have heard of D.W. Griffith's film Birth of a Nation and have been told and have been uh, and said to yourself 
that this is a horrible racist movie, right? And what it, you didn't realize was it was a propaganda film for the KKK. And even if you did, you go, well, yeah, it's a horrible racist movie. But if you actually look at the movie, in the beginning of that movie, it was still this whole sense of jealousy and less than. It was, they had black men in their, you know, uh, in, in, in their uh, county, in their charge. They were in the uh, public office. They were, you know, eat fried chicken. They had their uh, bare feet on the desk. They were considered like lazy and shiftless, but they were politicians. They had wealth. They had something. And the film was like, that's wrong. See how lazy and shiftless those people are, right? And then let's attack them. Let's bring in the heroes of the KKK. My point is, is that we look at that, that's bad, but we don't look at the success that we as black people have had in this period of time. We are now slowly. So my point is, is the fact that, that my, we're now got, starting to get cinema, film, media, and these are for people maybe who is teaching media, is that like when we're looking at films of that time period now, we're seeing like not just like um, Black Cowboys and, and Posse or, or in um, Magnificent Seven with Denzel Washington. We're looking at like films like The Current War, which was about Thomas Edison, you know, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch and Tom Holland. And we actually see, you know, he's getting interviewed by reporters and some of those reporters are Black. It's the fact that Black people actually had a life more than the downtrodden imagery that is represented. And if we don't actually talk about it, and as teachers, if we don't actually help inform young people that there is more to our past than the negativity, this is what I'm trying to say is how we actually combat racism. We actually have to stop separating the blacks and the whites and everything else and start looking at us as people like that we did in earlier this year when we joined forces. And how do we do this? We do this through education and communication. We talk about these things, right? So what, 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 what um, um, I'm doing right now when I'm looking at Black Essence, I'm learning. I'm learning as an old dog learning new tricks. I'm researching and I'm using Google, YouTube, and I'm finding stuff out that was hidden from me, right? As an adult. It's hidden from me. I didn't know, like, um, there were black samurais. How I many knew that? I didn't know that um, there were um, black kings and queens that actually traveled the ocean before the tall ships of Liverpool went over there. I didn't know that. I didn't know that, like, there was this um, – California was actually a separated – um, piece of land, so it was three islands: Hawaii, Baja, and what is and what will be California, right? And that land was taken over by a Moorish group of women, Moorish meaning Moors, right? Africans who settled there and they created their own paradise, right? And that is where, um, that is where I had sent pictures, but like maybe um um. Emma or Kersey could pass them on to you, or you could check them out yourself, is, to me, this is a great story of Empress Caliphia, right? And Empress Caliphia, which is very interesting to me because that is where they come up with the name of California. In the 1500s, she was ruling this land, right? And then the Spanish conquistadors, like Cortez and everything, you know, went, and all of a sudden, that rule started to delineate, meaning that it started to diminish because men entered, right? But the point is, is that if there were black people in the new world, the new world that would become America, if they traveled over there already before they came over in ships three centuries later, why do we not know this? In the 13th century, you know, there was the Mali Empire, right? And Prince Abu Bakr, or Abu Bakr II, right, had 
gave up his throne. His brother was in charge, and he wanted to go to the sea. He was a seafarer, and he traveled. And we don't, from West Africa, from Maori and everything, to have his adventures. If he did that in the 13th century there, and disappeared, there's a good chance, and maybe somebody could do the research, there's a good chance that that is how some of um, the darker tone people ended up, you know, in the, in, in the Caribbean uh, and, 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 and all that other kind of stuff, how, how um, Haiti and all these places were formed. Last one was like Queen Nanny of the Maroons, right? There have to be people who have heard of Nanny of the Maroons. And if you haven't, why? That is only like the, um, she, she was um, from Ghana, right? And everything. And she was a slave as the as, as people were, were everything. But she revolted, right? She formed her own people, right, in Jamaica. And then what happened was the British came in, the Redcoats came in. Now, this is kind of funny in a way, because the Redcoats came in thinking, hey, we're going to get us some uh, Africans, right? But then Nanny was clever. And what they did was they created this thing where they, they, they put, like, leaves and I mean, mud and stuff like that and hidden in the trees, right? So secret warfare, which is a style that we still have today called guerrilla warfare and the red coats in their bright red and white coats just came through the forest like duh, 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 duh. and of course they were defeated now instead of just like hey just killing off all of these british red coats you know they managed to make a deal with nanny and everything and then so they managed to kind of like come to an understanding so you can't enslave me but you can hire me that's kind of weird right <laughs> but the point is, is the fact that they weren't killers. They were just protecting themselves. My point about all of this is that Nanny derives, the name Nanny derives down to Nana, which is like if you're black, a lot of black people, you know, well, American black people anyway, I guess, I would call my grandmother Nana, as I would know my friends and other people would. So it's kind of like the origin of that. Queen Nanny will protect you. Nana is the matriarch of our family. Now, these are just some instances of what I call black role models or black excellence. There's so many more. But can you not feel that, how come I don't know this? What would that do for a young person to hear this? So when I've been doing my podcast this past month, I've had young people on my show. And I decided with different young people, I would educate them. Did you know this? Did you know this? And they didn't. And I said, well, what are you going to do with that information? And what they are doing is they're researching. They are empowering themselves. So if you ask, why am I telling you this particular story? It's because that's what I think you're looking for. Anti-race strategy is not us versus them. It's us becoming them. It's us working together. And the only way we could do that is through education. So as teachers, with a little bit of research, what will harm in telling these stories to other young black people that are in your courses so that way they can feel empowered through that learning? And then this doesn't cause a revolution. It just causes change. So to me, I just wanted to be able to kind of like set the stage with that you know, and I mean, be able to offer if there's any questions that people have at, at this moment in time. I just wanted to be able to kind of like give into context of how important education is to me. Even as an adult, an older person, you could still be educated by these things because it has been making me, I don't know, feel empowered to learn these particular stories. And there's just only a few. There's so many more stories out there and everything. Um, and I just feel that that's what we need to help to support. Um, because my thing is to strive to make people not feel less than, but more than. <clears throat> more than makes them feel more equal. And that's what I think that we can do as teachers in, in helping out um, young people um, with these kind of learnings.